Welcome to the Week 6 Sharp Football Show. My name is Warren Sharp of sharpfootballanalysis.com and sharpfootballstats.com. This show is live on Periscope every single Monday night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time for the 45 minutes leading up to kickoff of Monday Night Football. I go through a number of different observations that I saw from the games on Sunday. Many of them come with predictions, turn the page type discussion on the upcoming week's games or the rest of season data. So this week we cover a number of different topics, including Jason Garrett, including the Arizona Cardinals run game, including the LA Rams run defense. What is happening with the NFC and why are only four teams out of 16 sitting here with a winning record through five weeks of the season? Josh Rosen's debut, the Jacksonville Jaguars and their play calling in the first half and decision making. And then I'm joined by Evan Silva of rotoworld.com and we knock out a number of different discussion points, including uh, answering all of your fantasy questions. So if you guys like this show, guess what? It's actually a video. You can watch it on my YouTube channel. Just search Sharp Football Analysis on YouTube. You'll be able to find the Sharp Football Analysis YouTube channel. You can watch the video there. And if you want to actually participate in the Periscope, which includes live Q&A, interaction, me answering some of the audience's questions, uh, that's all up on the uh, Periscope, and you have to tune in Monday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Just follow me on Twitter, at Sharp Football, and you're going to be able to catch it. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive right into it. Hope you enjoy it. Feel free to subscribe on iTunes, Sharp Football Podcast, and also give it a rating, give it a review. With that said, let's go ahead and jump right in. Jason Garrett, a few weeks ago, uttered this quote. I can't, I can't re- really even comprehend it. I don't know what a conservative offense is. That was literally a real quote from Jason Garrett. Now, Mike Fisher, who covers the Dallas Cowboys, I tweeted out something about this last night on uh, my Twitter, at Sharp Football. If you're watching this, you obviously are following me or, or got the link. But uh, he said that he asked Jason Garrett about conservative offense. And he said that Jason Garrett really had no idea what he was even talking about. Like he didn't understand the word. This is a Dallas Cowboys reporter who talked to Jason Garrett, asked him about a conservative offense, and he said he didn't understand the word, what that means. And the guy had to explain to him, you know, two tight ends and a fullback, some of your play calling, etc. And he had no idea what it meant. Here was one of my tweets that I sent out yesterday after seeing what Jason Garrett did and, and punting the football there on fourth down. With the most expensive offensive line and the running back that they drafted, number four overall, investment in the run game, they punt the ball on fourth and one in overtime from their opponent's 42-yard line. Now, how is that in the least bit not being conservative, number one? It's completely conservative. Number two, it's very unintelligent. And you guys have heard a lot of different stats, I'm sure, thrown around. And for good reason, a lot of other people are covering this, talking about it. So I'm not going to belabor this discussion point. We have talked about and spoken about Jason Garrett and the coaching of the Dallas Cowboys for a little while now. But I do want to mention this one stat from Sharp Football Stats. The Dallas Cowboys just so happen, it's very ironic, they are the best team in the NFL when you need one yard, and the play is hand the ball off to a running back or a quarterback sneak it. Remember, they've got this running back, Ezekiel Elliott, he's pretty good, you know, and they also have a quarterback who's obviously very mobile. It's not like he's Peyton Manning, a 41-year-old Peyton Manning under center. This is a young kid in his rookie deal who is very mobile in Dak Prescott. They have been, the last three years, the best team in the league when needing one yard when they quarterback run it or hand it off to the running back. They have recorded an 81% success rate on these plays. And we're not talking about a very small sample size. I saw the stats thrown out there on fourth and one. They're like 19 out of 20, something like that. We are talking about a massive sample size of over 100 plays. The Dallas Cowboys the last three years have been the number one team in the NFL. So it's not as if, and I understand, well, they don't have injuries on the offensive line, this and that. You can say whatever you want. All the analytics that came out after this showed that this was the smart thing to do, was to run the ball, to try to stay on the field, not to punt the ball back, giving your other team the the opportunity. And what you also have to do, I'm not just talking about game theory, but when now you're deciding that you're playing a game and the opposing team has the upper hand, you have to take even more risks. And look at some of the stats on the game from yesterday. The Dallas Cowboys were averaging only 4.9 yards per play. 
the Houston Texans were at 6.1. Dallas was only averaging a 40% success rate on their plays. Houston was at 49%. Those really, they, they might seem close, but you guys are smart. You know, those are really pretty night and day. That's very dis, uh, um, polar opposites, 40% versus 49% in terms of success rate. The passing, which obviously correlates more to wins than, than does rushing, Houston was up at 60% and Dallas was down at 42%. So we're almost talking about a 20% difference, a 20% margin there. So no doubt about it, Dallas was losing this game. They needed something to get them back in it. I know that Jerry Jones came back afterwards and said we should have we should have gone for it. I would have liked to see us be aggressive, and I certainly would have too. But guess what? That's par for the course if you're a Dallas fan uh, to, to expect that is happening. I'm going to talk about an interesting story here, and this was actually... Um, trying to see who who actually uh, throw it out here. Uh, I believe it was Anthony uh, Anthony Staggs was having a conversation uh, with Ben Gretsch and then they copied me in on it because they put up some of my metrics from Sharp Football Stats and visualizations up on, on this thread. And it was talking about what the Arizona Cardinals have been doing when they're running the football. So this is pretty interesting here, guys. Um, Arizona obviously needs the upper hand. Now, I, I liked Arizona to win last yesterday against San Francisco. I thought they had a great chance. Um, and they're a very balanced team. Year to date, they're a very balanced team on first down. It's not like they're ultra run heavy. It's not like they've been putting Josh Rosen in horrible situations by running the ball too much. But what they're not doing is not running very intelligently. And if this shows up at all, um, we'll see how it looks. But Bottom line here is this is some visualizations off of Sharp Football Stats, and you could see when they're running across the field here, they're they're pretty bad everywhere. There's there's not like one area. I mean, here's a 5.0 behind the right guard, but we're not talking. Of, they don't have very many runs behind the right guard. They only have two runs behind the right guard. 61 of their runs. Now this all you'll see on the screen is like a dark blue triangle here, but this is these are lighter blue triangles here. They're colored based upon frequency. So the more that they run the ball in a certain direction, the darker that colored triangle is going to be. 61 of their runs have come right up the middle, 61. I mean, they don't have anything more than like four, four to the left end, nine to the left tackle, four to the left guard, two to the right guard, two to the right tackle, and seven to the left end, and 61 up the middle, 61 runs right up the middle. And right here, you're not going to be able to see this all that well, but this is a look at their successful run rate for David Johnson on first down runs. And David Johnson has been a horrific 7 of 31. 7 of his runs on first and 10 so far this year have graded out as successful. 7 out of 31 rushing attempts. That's a very poor rate, 23% success rate. What's going to happen here is you're going to put Josh Rosen in a bad situation and because of the, the predictable rushing right up the middle, you've got to come up with new ideas and ways to run the football. We're going to come back to Josh Rosen in a second, though, but let's first talk about another team in the NFC West, a team that's very surprising right now, and that's the LA Rams. The LA Rams are very surprising because they're of their run defense. Very difficult. Very difficult what they've been doing. So they have played the second easiest schedule year to date of run offenses, and let's look at the teams that they've played. Minnesota literally cannot run the football whatsoever. They ranked dead last in the NFL. They also played the Arizona Cardinals, who ranked 31st. I just showed you what some of the problems that Arizona was dealing with running the football. They've played three teams that rank above 31. Okay, three teams that rank above 31. The 22nd ranked Seattle Seahawks, who they just played, the 19th ranked Oakland Raiders, and the 10th ranked Los Angeles Chargers. That's all they've played. So one team in the top 10. Every other team has been below average with the two worst teams in the league in terms of running the football. And yet, here's what they allowed in those games. Seattle, 6.5 yards per carry and a 60% success rate. 6.5. The Chargers, 6.1 yards per carry, also a 60% success rate. And the Raiders, 4.1 yards per carry and a 56% success rate. All three of these teams have been able to run the football against the Los Angeles Chargers. Now, the Oakland Raiders, that was week one, so that seems like a distant memory, right? But the Chargers and the Seahawks was not that long ago, and they ran the ball. Both of them posted 60% success rate. Now, why is this a concern? Well, you can go up to Sharp Football Stats, and you can look at the upcoming schedule for the Rams and what they're going to be dealing with when they run the football. Here's what they're looking at. Next week, this very next week, week six in the NFL, 
The Rams play the Broncos, who rank number two in rushing efficiency. They got two backs who can get the job done, very explosive out of the backfield. That could be problematic for, uh, for the uh, LA Rams defense. Then they play in their next six weeks, they play four teams that rank in the top 10 in terms of rushing efficiency, four teams. The next closest team, so they just got abused by Seattle on the ground. They literally don't play another team that has a worse run defense than the Seattle Seahawks until they play the Seattle Seahawks again week 16. Okay, the next, from from week 6 onwards all the way to week 16, they play more difficult run, I'm sorry, they, they don't play a team that's weaker than Seattle until week 16 when they play the Arizona Cardinals. Every single other team that they're going to face this season up until week 16 when they play the Arizona Cardinals is going to have an equal to or better run game than what they just saw last week. And the remind you, the Seattle Seahawks just ran for 6.5 yards per carry and a 60% success rate. So as creative and as good as this Rams offense is, they're going to have to be on the ball. And I will, I do believe that it's a good thing if you've got Rams players on your fantasy team moving forward because they're going to need to keep the pace up offensively to deal with these opposing teams. Now, I know that once Todd Gurley and they get clinched their playoff seeding and everything at the tail end of the season, you're going to be in trouble at that point. But they're not going to be able to like outdistance people because even the bad teams are going to be able to run the football on these guys and, and try to help move the ball down the field. So. That's a big concern for, for this team, and I know we're going to talk to Evan Silva a little bit later about the idea of, oh, well, we're going to invite the run and let you just run the ball. Well, we saw how that got them, where that got them for uh, the Seattle Seahawks. So I don't know if that's necessarily the absolute best strategy. I don't think anybody in L.A. is happy that they're allowing the Rams, I'm sorry, that they're allowing the Seahawks to run the ball as much as they are. Let's talk about the NFC a little bit. Because this is pretty surprising. So heading into the season, I believe it was of the top 11 teams, the teams that were projected to win the most games this season in the NFL, of those 11 teams, eight of them were in the NFC. Eight of the top 11 teams projected to win the most games this year were going to be out of the NFC. So far this year, through five weeks, we only have four teams out of 16 in the entire NFC that have a winning record. The Rams, obviously 5-0. and If the Saints win tonight, that is. If the Saints win tonight, the Saints will be 4-1. and The Redskins will drop to 2-2. Uh, to two and two. Uh, The Panthers are 3-1. and one, And the Bears are 3-1. and one. That is it. That is the only teams in the NFC that have winning records right now, um, which is surprising. In the AFC, just to give you some perspective, there's eight teams. Eight teams in the AFC have winning records right now. But only four will have it if the Saints win tonight. Here's a listing of the other teams that were in the NFC. All of these teams were projected to be above 500, to have to be to win at least eight and a half games in uh, the regular season win totals. Eight and a half games. Here they are. The Philadelphia Eagles are at two and three. Now they've been su- suffering some injuries. Their secondary is really banged up. They didn't have Carson Wentz the first couple of weeks. This is a team that really needs to get back on track and get back on track quickly. They have a Thursday night game against the New York Giants. Could be a, that game's going to be vitally important for both of those teams in the NFC. So that's going to be a massive game Thursday night. The Minnesota Vikings, they're a team that's supposed to win uh, second to most games in the NFC. They've, they're only 2 2 and 1 so far this year. They looked good against the Eagles last week, but their defense has not looked good, especially compared to what our expectations were at the start of the season. The Green Bay Packers, 2 2 and 1. They're another team. They dealt with Aaron Rodgers having his knee injury. Uh, But this is a team, if you take away the big massive win that they had over the Buffalo Bills, which, I mean, the Bills are are staying competitive. They got a win over the Tennessee Titans. But 1-2-1, and that's what the Green Bay Packers are. And their one win came by one point over Mitchell Trubisky week one. So uh, Mitchell Trubisky and the Bears have gotten a lot better since that point in time. But that's it. They have one win by one point in four other games besides beating the Bills. The Atlanta Falcons, 1-4, and four, suffered cluster injuries all over their defense. They were supposed to win, I want to say it was nine games. Then the Dallas Cowboys, they were at eight and a half wins, two and three, with a terrible coaching situation, a run-based offense with injuries along the offensive line. 
Uh, I think we a lot of us predicted they were going to struggle this season, and they are. And then the 49ers. 49ers were, I think, lined at nine wins to start the year. They got bet towards the under, down to eight and a half, and uh, it's for good reason. I mean, this team, obviously, they lost Jimmy Garoppolo, so that's going to be a problem, but it's not as if they were coasting with Jimmy Garoppolo. It was going to be a very difficult season for them to have a lot of success this year. And so, of course, they're sitting here at one and four now that he's done. Josh Rosen, I want to just use this as a, as a talking point about strength of schedule and what to look for. If you listened to this show last week, you were tuning in last week at 7.30 Eastern, you saw us flash up this graphic and you heard me talking about Josh Rosen's debut. This is the strength of schedule graphic you can find at sharpfootballstats.com. These are the passing defenses that the Arizona Cardinals have faced so far this year. And you could see they faced four teams that ranked inside the top 10 in terms of difficult pass defenses. So this is the, the closer down to the bottom and the more in red the bar is, that means the better that defense is. So for example, the Rams were number two, two uh, number two best pass defense, the Bears number three, the Seahawks number four, the Redskins number eight. Boom, who was this? San Francisco, who they played last week, fourth worst team in the league defending the pass ranked number 29, and guess who goes in there and gets a win pretty easily and has a good day throwing the football around? Josh Rosen. So I flashed this graphic up and I told you guys that you should be on the lookout for this. This is just an example. It's not to say that I was right about this, but I just want to show you an example of why strength of schedule and a lot of the tools up at Sharp Football Stats use them to try to find edges where teams have played difficult schedules and all of a sudden they're going to play a very easy team things of that nature because those are where you can find edges using strength of schedule and using these tools really opens it up to you right like you could see this right away it's not as if you're like looking at black and white text this jumps off the page to you where the 49ers rank as opposed to these teams that they played jacksonville jaguars first half man if you if you guys watch this game I don't know how many of you guys actually watched this game, but this was a very frustrating game to actually watch. No, I liked the Jaguars. I thought they were going to have a good shot in this game. But if you look at the first half of this game, both teams on first down, 3.1 yards per play. In the first half on first down, both were terrible. It's not as if the Chiefs were like running ragged all over these guys. 3.1 yards per play. Both teams couldn't pass the ball a lick on first down. The Jags had nine attempts, only averaged one yards per attempt, one. The Chiefs with Patrick Mahomes, everybody's talking about Patrick Mahomes for good reason. The guy has been lighting the league on fire. Eight attempts on first down in the first half, two yards per attempt. Great defense by this Jacksonville Jaguars secondary. So what happened? How how did, if if they're just about as good as what the Jags were doing, uh, as what the Chiefs were doing on first down, how do they have such a large deficit at halftime? Well, The Jags went 56% pass on first down. 56%. I already told you what they did when they passed the ball. One yard per attempt and a 33% success rate. When they ran the ball on first down, 5.9 yards per attempt and an 86% success rate. Yet they go more pass than run. For what reason, Nathaniel Hackett? For what reason are you doing this? Okay, That's a concern. We're going to keep talking about this coming back to it. On all downs, on all downs, the Jaguars were 4.7 yards per attempt when they passed the ball and only a 42% success rate. But when they ran the ball, 5.9 yards per carry and a 75% success rate. 75% success rate on all downs in the first half and only a 42% success rate when they passed the ball. Again, why are they throwing the ball so much when their run game is clicking and having success? Let's look at the entirety of the game. The entirety of the game. The Jaguars had a lot of opportunities in the red zone of the Chiefs. They had 12, uh, 13 plays down there. 11 of the 13 plays were passes. 11. Blake Bortles had an 18% success rate. He was 3 of 11 in the red zone. Threw two interceptions. They had two runs and had a 100% success rate. Now, there's a very good question just asked. I thought it was better to pass the ball on first down. It's better to call efficient plays on first down. Most of the time, it's going to be passing the football. But you're not going to want to always just pass the football on first down. And when you go on the road and you've got Blake Bortles as your quarterback and you're playing a defense that can't stop the run, guess what? If you're having a 75% success rate running the football, then I'd like you to run the football, especially when your pass rate is down to like a 33% success rate on first down and you're averaging one yard per attempt. One. So what are they doing in the red zone here? 
it, it's impossible for other people not to notice what Nathaniel Hackett is screwing up yet again this season about this play calling in the red zone. How is this normal at all? This is actually more infuriating, I think, than what the Houston Texans did on Sunday night in front of everybody. Another thing that's infuriating is this right here. Dante Moncrief is your man. Dante Moncrief is the guy that you are targeting 15 times in the game. He's, he averages, he posted 5.1 yards per attempt, a 29 passer rating when targeted. Just an FYI, teams stink when they target Dante Moncrief a lot. Now, some of this is cause and effect. I'm not going to pretend that this is not because obviously teams, when they're losing, are going to throw the football a little bit more. They're 0 6 when targeting him 10 plus times. He's never caught more than 58% of those targets. He does not catch the ball well. When Moncrief is targeted at least eight times in games, he has never caught above well, his average is 45% catch rate. He's got a 45% catch rate when he's targeted a lot in the game. When teams decide to make him more of a focal point and throw him the ball more, he doesn't catch it and averages 4.2 yards per attempt. How is this your game plan going into Kansas City, throwing the ball just to Dante Moncrief a ton? It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever to do that. Now, uh, the reason why it's it's uh, it's a problem, and we're going to get Evan on here, and he'll listen to my rant a little bit. Evan, what is up, buddy? What's up, Warren? How you doing, man? Oh, man, I am not doing good because I'm talking about the Jaguars' idiocy in the red zone as well as their play, their game plan. So you're going to have to hear this a little bit, and then we're going to jump into talking about the, uh, the Monday night game. Is that cool with you? All right, so the Jags' defense actually did pretty good. Patrick Mahomes on early downs, he was only 18 of 30. He only had a 53% success rate. He only averaged eight yards per attempt and 85 passer rating. No touchdowns on early downs. When Patrick Mahomes was in the red zone, they were two of eight. Only 1.5 yards per attempt and a 39.6 rating. In the red zone against the Jacksonville Jaguars defense, Patrick Mahomes was two of eight and averaged 1.5 yards per attempt. That is what the Jacksonville Jaguars defense did. They stepped up. They played well. They held him to a 53% success rate and an 85 passer rating, 18 of 30. And yet Nathaniel Hackett decides to put the ball in Blake Bortles' hands, run the game plan through Blake Bortles, even though their rushing is so successful in the first half, even though they get into the red zone, they're throwing the ball 11 out of 13 plays. It made no sense. And I criticized Nathaniel Hackett on this pot, on this, uh, periscope a couple of weeks ago when they played the New York Jets, who were very good at the time stopping the run on first down. And they had Leonard Fournette back that game. And instead of throwing the ball, they ran the ball a ton and got no gains there. And so they had to resort to throwing the football on second down. And he had a ton of success throwing the ball on second down and and kept them in the game. That's why, in part, they won. Not because of what they did on first down. It's because of what Blake Bortles did on second and third downs passing. Here, in this case, you go there. You go into Kansas City. Difficult place to play. It's raining. Did you see Blake Bortles' his passes? I mean, I saw a clip on Twitter. He throws the ball, just wobbles out of his hands like a duck. He spikes it into the back of his offensive lineman's head and it turns it into an interception on like the eight yard line. This is not the guy that if your run game is clicking, you should just say, oh, well, let's just throw the ball because of analytics. No, if your run game is crushing and your pass game is not, let's make adjustments and start running the ball a little bit more. Very frustrating. All right, Evan, it's your turn, my friend. Let's talk a little Monday night football. Let's talk a little about Monday Night Football. And guys, uh, if you're on here, great. We're going to take your questions after we talk through some of these things with Evan Silva. So Evan, let's talk about the Monday Night Football game and the Redskins. Let's talk about the first... Sorry, and by the way, guys, follow Evan on Twitter if you're not. I mean, he's the godfather, but you follow him if you haven't, at Evan Silva on Twitter. Uh, what is the matchup, Evan, that you think is going to determine the game tonight? Um... Well, it, I think it's an int- the game. The way that the game sets up is kind of interesting because the Redskins are like a classic run funnel defense, where they're terrible in run defense, but they're really good in pass defense. And the Saints are like a pass funnel defense. They're really good in run defense, but really bad in pass defense. So, where does that leave us? Um, I think. 
think that it sets up nicely from a matchup standpoint as a Chris Thompson game. Um, and I think it, it sets up nicely uh, for uh, Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara on the other side. So I think that these teams' ability to exploit the other team's weakness and avoid their strengths uh, will determine the outcome of the game. Yeah, I think it's very interesting to note that the Washington Redskins so far this year have the number four most efficient passing offense despite going up against the second most difficult schedule of pass defenses. Now they get to face the Saints, who have the league's worst pass defense, and that includes factoring in that Eli Manning did absolutely nothing, basically, in the game last week. And I think the Saints' defense looked better last week because of the Giants' offense and them going up against the Giants than they will tonight against the Washington Redskins. And I know it seems counterintuitive because a lot of people look at the Giants and they think, well, they have more weapons. They have Odell. They have Sterling Shepard. But the reality is the Redskins' passing attack has been quite efficient. It's not overly explosive, although they do rank 7th best in the league in explosive passing, and they do have Paul Richardson. They're getting him involved more. But I think the Redskins have like just this... No, no, no flash, no glitter, but a very productive passing attack. They got a great tight end they can throw the ball to. They got a great running back out of the backfield they can throw the ball to. Um, and then they got a run game that Jay Gruden, fortunately, has not been going too berserk with calling too many early down runs like he has sometimes in the past, especially first down runs, not going too berserk. And they're having a lot of success running the football as well. Um, I, my main concern, Evan, in this game, um, because, guys, if, we, if you're looking at this game from a gambling standpoint, right now the line is down to five and a half, and that should ring bells in your head when a team yeah. like the Saints is at home on prime time. Remember, Evan, when like the Saints were home at prime time, it was like auto bet they would cover. They would be like up 35 to 7 at halftime. I mean, this used to be a team in New Orleans, in the Dome, at home. It was just you could do nothing there. They had the biggest home field advantage for so long. And right now, guys, this line, while it opened at 7 at some of the sharper offshore shops and some 6.5, is now down to 5.5 despite public money coming in on the New Orleans yeah, Saints. Yeah, that's interesting. What, what was it at? It, it was earlier at like a touchdown, right? Yep, it was at 7. It opened at 7, a pinnacle. So the 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 uh, I this the Redskins are definitely the sharp side here. The Saints are definitely the public side. Now, just because they're the Redskins are the sharp side does not mean it's always going to win. As you guys should know, that the sharp sides aren't always going to win, and sometimes they might lose badly. But for this game, that's the side that the professionals have backed, and you can see in the line that's dropping now down to. Five and a half. The main concern for me is the Redskins' run defense because that run defense, Evan, hasn't been tested very much. They played about a league average schedule. They rank second worst in rushing efficiency. The total is 51 and a half for the guy who's asking, some 52. Um, and the Saints obviously have the sixth best run offense. They get back Melvin Ingram, uh, sorry, Mark Ingram. It'll be interesting to see how they go about trying to incorporate him in, work him in. We talked about this on our pod, Evan, so I won't belabor that point, but. I, I think this is going to be a really competitive game. Any more thoughts on this one before we uh, before we tackle a couple other questions? No, let's move on. All right. So, what is one of the biggest surprises that you saw yesterday? I mean, it was a, a surprise filled Sunday for sure. Um, I <clears throat> was skeptical of this this Bills uh, Titans game a little bit because the Titans were coming off this big home game upset of. Philadelphia, and the Bills were coming off a shutout loss uh, at Lambeau, and were going home, and the Titans were going on the road. But I continued to see movement in the Titans' direction. I mean, it opened, I think, is uh, the Bills were, or the Titans were four-point favorites, and it closed in a lot of spots as the Titans were seven-point favorites. So... I mean, you know, just based on the line movement, I was surprised at the outcome of that game. I watched that game uh, live, and, I mean, the Titans just could get nothing going on offense. Uh, the Bills weren't particularly impressive themselves. All they needed to do was kick two field goals and the early Josh Allen uh, rushing TD to get it done. They did create a ton of turnovers in the game, though, uh, and that wound up being the difference, the, the turnover differential. But I would say that one probably just almost purely based on the line movement, that wound up as being 
the, the biggest surprise of Sunday. <clears throat> um, the Eagles' inability to generate really any offense uh, was less of a surprise, but more of just a disappointment. Um, they, I guess they did uh, find, you know, uh, end up making it relatively close uh, on the final stat sheet, but uh, I mean they were kind of they kind of got their butts kicked in that game by the Vikings. Yeah, I'll say for for the uh, the first game that was there was a very sharp syndicate group who was on uh, the Tennessee Titans and, and really hammered that line completely in that direction. Um, there might have been some piggybackers on the day who got in at worse lines and kept piling on, but they were the main reason. So a lot of times, I mean, it, it sounds funny, but a lot of times, like just because the line is moving heavily in one direction, it could just be one group with like a very strong opinion about a certain outcome and. They're not always right. And in this case, they were very wrong, uh, of course, because Buffalo was in that game from start to finish. If you look back at the Eagles and if you look at like their advanced box score, I mean, overall, this team was not playing all that bad in that game. They just had some key issues and, and, and problems. They had obviously the turnover down at the six yard line on first and goal. And now they lost Jay Ajay. Evan, we got to talk about their running back situation, uh, later on. So let's just, let's just keep rolling. Um, because I know there's going to be some questions about that. There already have been popping up here. What is one prediction that you nailed, Evan? Yeah, I mean, I, I had a pretty good week. Tonight I need, like, a, I'm first in the FanDuel bomb uh, on yes. a Thursday, Thursday, Monday slate. Yes. I'm, I'm, uh, everyone is dead behind me, I, and I'm dead, too, in terms of I have no players left. Uh, but there is a guy in, like, 16, and he needs 16 points to catch me. I, I haven't checked who his player is yet that he has left, but I'm guessing it would be like Alvin Kamara or Michael Thomas or, or something like that. So I'm really, really rooting for Redskins like a and under twenty to thirteen game, which of course won't happen. But you know that, that's that's what I would love to see. Um, but you know, definitely like Odell Beckham bouncing back and Antonio Brown going off, and you know Marcus Valdez Scantling having a big game. It was it, it was a good week in terms of predictiveness. For sure, I got, and I, again, I always get a million stuff wrong. You know, I like the over in that Eagles uh, Vikings did you, the game. You did as well. Yep. Um, you know, I, I I got a million stuff wrong, but um, but it, but overall, it was definitely like more positive than, than negative week in terms of predictiveness. Excellent. All right. Well, let's knock this one out real quick, and then we'll take questions. What was one a player or team that you think is going to bounce back after not playing that well yet last week? Uh, so the Giants, you know, they hung tough against Carolina. And, you know, one thing that we've talked about over the years is that teams coming off a bye don't necessarily, that they don't necessarily benefit from that. And I do a podcast with Ross Tucker and I've talked to him about that, why that might be. And, you know, he's told me that, um, he played for certain teams that were really good coming off of a bye and other teams that weren't as good coming off a of bye. You know, you get out of your weekly routine. You're not doing the, you know, you're not going to practice every day. You're going home to see your family. Obviously, there are, are great, you know, personal benefits that can come from that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to go play better on Sunday just because you had a bye. You know, and then we had um, Hayden Winks, who uh, last year worked for the uh, the San Diego, Char- or the Los Angeles Chargers, and uh, he he did a little study on this, and he noticed that teams were just hot, more higher variance coming off the bye. Like they were likelier. Some of, some of them smashed. You know, some of them would come off the bye and, and play really really well. Some uh, others would play below expectation. And I thought the Panthers played below expectation, particularly Cam. Cam had his worst game of the season. Um, but the Panthers, or the, the Giants, played relatively well in that game. Now they are coming back home uh, to face this just injury decimated Eagles team, and the Giants are desperate for a win. The Eagles are pretty desperate for a win too, by the way. Oh, they're ma- massively yeah, desperate. They're, yeah, this is a they're, huge they're, game. They're, they're two and three, and you know they just won the Super Bowl. So it's and this is a, a division game. So this is going to be one of the most compelling games of the week. Both these teams really need this badly. Um, you know, look, if the Giants start one and five, do they start thinking about 
you know, playing Kyle Loletta or, you know, I mean, they need to start thinking about maybe making some changes. Uh, and whereas, you know, with the Eagles, you know, if like, do they go trade for Le'Veon Bell? That's something that has been rumored. You know, they just lost Jay Ajayi to an ACL tear. So this Thursday night game has massive implications uh, in terms of the roster, in terms of the rest of the season, in terms of the division, in terms of who's going to go to the playoffs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm excited for this Thursday night game. Yeah, I am as well. Um, now let's talk real quick uh, about, guys, we can start firing away your questions. I'll move a little closer to the screen here. But one thing about this run game for the Eagles, um, you know, Wendell Smallwood, if you go to Sharp Football Stats, you go to the rushing page, Wendell Smallwood's averaging 6.4 6 yards per carry on first down. He's averaging 6.0 yards per carry overall. Uh, he's the only Eagles back with above 4.1 yards per carry. So, I'm anxious to see what they end up doing at the running back position. I know Adam Schefter came out and said they're not going to do anything with uh, with Le'Veon Bell. But, I mean, I don't know that you can rely on Wendell Smallwood the rest of the season. Um, I mean, hopefully they'll get Corey Clement back soon. Uh, do you have any uh, a quick take on that, Evan? Yeah, um, that Colts, the, the game against the Colts uh, really stood out to me uh, because that was a game where it looked like Corey Clement was going to kind of dominate, uh, but he actually wound up getting outplayed by Wendell Smallwood. Yep. And then the last two weeks, Corey Clement has been out. Wendell Smallwood has played really well. Really well. Uh, Wendell Smallwood was like a surprisingly key part of their game plan last week. They were trying to get him to rock in the passing game and with success. And as you mentioned, he's been very, very efficient as a rusher. I, I haven't been a, a big fan of Wendell Smallwood over the past – uh, two, three years, you know, he hasn't been particularly effective, but it seems like he's taken a step forward this year. And when both he and Trump and Corey Clement have been a healthy, Wendell Smallwood has outplayed Corey Clement. Um, you know, and they have another dude by the name of Josh Adams, undrafted rookie out of Notre Dame, uh, kind of a bigger back, you know, not necessarily a pass catcher, had pretty good measurables coming out. He's pretty interesting. He's been relatively effective uh, on his carries early in the season. So, yeah, on early early downs, he's doing well. Uh, but I think that Wendell Smallwood, out of the guys that are remaining, uh, Wendell Smallwood has played the best, and so, and he's a guy that you know has been around for a few years, so people are, might sleep on him. Uh, but I think that in terms of like being a fantasy pickup, he's pretty interesting. Yep. No, I I agree. Um, all right, guys, let's roll through some of your questions. Uh, Let's roll through some of your fantasy questions uh, or any other questions that you might have for Evan. Evan, we're going to try to answer each of these in one sentence. I'll help out uh, where I can, but let's try to get through a lot of these because the game's kicking off in about six minutes. Um, what do they do with Alex Collins? I mean, you leave him on your bench. Yeah, you, I agree. You know what you were getting into. Yep. You know, he stumbled at the goal line twice in, or he fumbled at the goal line twice in the first four games. So you, you knew that that put him at risk of, you know, continuing to losing, lose playing time and touches. Uh, they That was a very low-scoring game on Sunday, and so you couldn't have expected, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, him to do very much. But he's, he's a bench stash at this point. All right. Will DJ Moore break out for the Panthers? Yeah, I think that he will have, have a big game. Uh, we saw them coming off the bye. He was much more involved. Uh, so that is a positive step. Um, who does Carolina play this week? I can't remember. Uh, Carolina plays... Uh, I think they're on the road. Yeah, Washington. They don't have a lineup yeah, on that one yet. Yes, at Washington. So yeah. playing the Redskins coming off a short week. Um, All right, well, let's... I, I mean, that's, that's not a great pass defense matchup, you know, but I, I do think a breakout week with DJ Moore is coming in terms of, like, the predictive ability... You know, our ability to predict that, I mean, it's, uh, well, we'll see. We'll see about that. Yep. Um, uh, unders asking me about my unders. I've hit, I've played two, hit two. So we play what is valuable right now. We're, I'm not, I'm not ruling out anything. Each week is going to be different. Um, why don't the Packers give Jones more touches? Aaron Jones. They fell behind and they've never used him in the passing game. So, He's not going to get touches in scenarios like that. Have the Steelers fixed their defense, or is that a mirage? Uh, they do. They, I mean, 
they have the ability to rush the passer, and that's what they did against Matt Ryan. They had six sacks. So, uh, I mean, they I don't know why their defense is so freaking bad. It's like it's coached poorly. Like they, ha- It's not like they don't have <laughs> – A lot of things are coached a poorly with that team. Players. Like their personnel is actually pretty good. But they have like so many miscommunications and breakdowns that, you, I mean, you have to kind of look at coaching. Um, no, I, I 100% agree about the coaching there. Uh, Crowder or Paul Richardson tonight? I guess some guys. Um, I think that Marshawn Lattimore will be on Paul Richardson, and he really hasn't gotten targets so far. Uh, so I, I would go with Crowder. Crowder's got a better matchup. He hasn't gotten many targets either, but he was good before the bye, and uh, hopefully they found ways to incorporate him more coming off the bye. Yep. Um, is Josh Gordon going to break out this week? Feels like it's about to happen. What do you I think? agree with that. Um, he had two catches for 50 yards and a touchdown last week. Uh, you know, they have the extra days to get him incorporated a little bit more coming off the Thursday game. Uh, and they're going to need to score points against um, uh, against Kansas City. That, that, should, that has a massive total, 59-point total, which is just uh, – it's like the biggest since 2004 or something. I mean, it's a, it's a great season. Man. The pr- – the problem with uh, with relying on like a breakout, so to speak, is that there's a lot of mouths to feed, and Brady is very judicious yeah. about just spreading the ball around and looking for matchups. He's not looking like, oh, well, this is going to be the Josh Al- uh, Josh Gordon game this week. He he's looking for matchups, and they got a great run game. That, I, I heard those players that Evan talk after the game about the running back and how they got him going, and uh, I think that they're definitely going to keep. Uh, trying to get Sony Michelle involved as well on the ground. So they're going to have the opportunity. We saw what Jacksonville's run game was able to do. So they're going to be able to run the ball too. Um, do you think Case Keenum is going to get benched? I know you have some strong thoughts on, uh, on, on working in your boy Chad out there. Uh, I have no idea. I would, I would like to see uh, Chad Kelly play, but you know, that doesn't mean anything for their decision making. Right. Um, Something about Quincy Inunua with a cast on his hand. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. He apparently he told the so the you know the the guys like covering each game get the opportunity to go talk with the coaches and the players before the game. They go to a practice or two, and uh, apparently Inunua told the announcers. I think it was CBS that did the game that. Uh, well, he was listed on the injury report with a hip, uh, but he was wearing a brace on his hand, uh, and then he played in the he played in the game with the brace on his hand, and he had a drop on a quick screen. He couldn't. He had a chance at a long touchdown and couldn't corral it. Uh, so he he had five targets and zero catches. All right, last question, Evan. Um, AP or Chris Thompson? A guy wants to know real quick for tonight's game. Uh, Chris Thompson. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much for all your questions. Evan, I'll let you go while I'm signing off with these guys. Thanks again, buddy. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks so much. I'm going to go ahead and watch this game tonight. Uh, should be pretty interesting. We'll see what type of strategy the Redskins take, if they run the ball too much or not. Sign up for uh, and subscribe to the Sharp Football Analysis Podcast. comes out every Friday. This week we will be having Dr. Chow back on to talk about injuries. So it's going to be Evan, Dr. Chow, myself on there Friday night, recorded at like midnight, 11 p.m. Eastern, midnight, overnight, released on Saturday morning, give you guys all the latest injury information and other stuff. So I uh, highly recommend you guys check that out and uh, enjoy the game tonight and make sure that you're tuning into to sharpfootballstats.com. A lot of great information there. And check out sharpfootballanalysis.com if you want to see my recommendations for week six. All right, guys, thanks once again, and we'll talk to you soon.